This is Justin Brandt of the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences of the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. On behalf of myself and my collaborator, Dr. Candy Ananth, I am pleased to give this introduction to our review article, Placental Abruption at Near-Term and Term Gestations, Pathophysiology, Epidemiology, Diagnosis, and Management. This paper was accepted for publication in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology and is planned for publication in 2022. The objectives of our review article are outlined on this slide. We review the pathophysiology and epidemiology of abruption at near-term and term gestations. We review the sonographic findings and fetal heart rate tracings and discuss clinical management of acute abruption. We review blood component therapy, viscoelastic point of care testing and disseminated intravascular coagulopathy and conclude with a discussion of short-term and long-term maternal and perinatal risks. Placental abruption is the premature separation of the placenta from its uterine attachment before the delivery of a fetus. Although the clinical manifestations are myriad, abruption is classically associated with vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain with or without uterine contractions and is often accompanied by abnormal fetal heart rate patterns. Abruption occurs in 0.6 to 1.2% of all pregnancies, with nearly half of abruption occurring at term gestations. The discussion of abruption in near term, defined as the late preterm period from 34 weeks to 36 weeks and 6 days, and term gestations, defined as greater than or equal to 37 weeks, gives unique insight into the direct effects of abruption. Placental abruption is the end result of an acute process or the culmination of long-standing chronic processes, or both. Chronic processes that predispose to abruption include thrombosis, inflammation, infection, and decidual and uteroplacental vasculopathy. These processes lead to placental hypoperfusion and defective spiral artery remodeling, placental infarction, and shallow trophoblast invasion. Acute processes leading to abruption are largely the consequence of mechanical and shearing forces applied to the abdomen. There may be an inciting event that precipitates abruption, such as abdominal trauma or rapid decompression of the uterine cavity following amniotomy. Rupture of maternal decidual vessels leads to bleeding at the decidual placental interface and detachment of the placenta from the uterus. Decidual bleeding that results in dissection and laceration along the decidual plane may lead to retroplacental, subchorionic, and subamniotic bleeding. Intraplacental accumulation of blood may also occur due to disruption of vasculopathic decidual arterioles. Decidual bleeding leads to the release of excess thrombin, which is generated by tissue factor expressed on decidual cells to promote hemostasis. This results in degradation of extracellular matrix and further endothelial injury from enhanced expression of matrix metalloproteinases, as well as the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-8. These factors, coupled with the uterotonic effects of thrombin, may lead to rupture of membranes and uterine contractions. Clinical and non-clinical risk factors and their strengths of association with abruption are summarized here and on the following slide. Since associations of risk factors for near-term and term abruption are unavailable, we present the associations for all abruption, regardless of gestational age, diagnosis, or delivery. Pregnant people with abruption in one pregnancy carry up to a tenfold increased risk of recurrence in a subsequent pregnancy. The recurrence risk is 25-fold higher in a third pregnancy when two prior pregnancies are complicated by abruption. The risk of abruption is three to four-fold higher among pregnant people with chronic hypertension and four to six-fold higher among those with preeclampsia, particularly preeclampsia with sphere features and superimposed preeclampsia. Other clinical risk factors for abruption include pregestational and gestational diabetes, preterm prelabor, rupture of membranes, chorioamnionitis, and oligohydramnios. Many factors are associated with abruption, but the factors that have the greatest risk include prior abruption, chronic hypertension, preeclampsia, cocaine and drug use, and intimate partner violence. On this slide, we provide more information about associations of risk factors stratified by obstetrical history, behavioral risk factors, and sociodemographic factors. Acute abruption is characterized by the sudden onset of vaginal bleeding, and chronic abruption is characterized by recurrent episodes of light to moderate bleeding. The clinical manifestations of abruption are influenced by the caliber and location of maternal decidual vessels, as well as the criticity of the bleeding.
Classic symptoms of abruption include vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain. Uterine contractions are often present, but contractions are not a specific abruption characteristic since painful uterine contractions are also present in normal labor. Although there is a potential for bleeding from fetal sources, associated vaginal bleeding is typically of maternal origin. Ultimately, abruption is a clinical diagnosis. Ultrasound may identify findings concerning for abruption, especially when abnormal blood collections adjacent to and within the placenta are large. In a study of ultrasound characteristics among 30 patients with abruption, ultrasound had sensitivity of 57% and specificity of 100%. Concealed abruption may manifest in pregnant people with symptoms of abdominal pain and uterine contractions, but without overt vaginal bleeding or with small quantities of bleeding. Concealed abruption can be severe and lead to fetal death and coagulopathy. Although ultrasound is a useful adjunct in identifying and diagnosing placental abruption, there are limitations of ultrasound due to the similar echo texture of hemorrhagic products and placenta. This is illustrated in the following images. Um, this case comes from a pregnant patient with vaginal spotting who was observed to have a large subchorionic hematoma at 32 weeks gestation. In this context, she was diagnosed with abruption. After a period of inpatient surveillance, she was discharged home with outpatient follow-up. Um, at 35 weeks gestation, she had a repeat evaluation of the subchorionic hematoma. The hematoma was visible, but appeared slightly smaller and was a, uh, had similar appearance to adjacent placental tissue. A wide array of abnormal fetal heart rate patterns is possible, reflecting the underlying pathophysiology of abruption. In acute and severe abruption, there is often marked fetal bradycardia with absent variability, which is a preterminal fetal heart rate pattern. This fetal bradycardia can occur suddenly or can be heralded by variable late or prolonged decelerations. Fetal tachycardia and minimal or absent variability may or may not be present. In cases of decreased fetal placental blood flow and hypoxia, sinusoidal fetal heart rate patterns can be seen prior to the terminal bradycardia. Abnormalities in the uterine contraction pattern, such as tetanic or high-frequency low-amplitude contractions, may also be present. In chronic abruption, there may be normal fetal heart rate patterns and tocodynametry, allowing conservative management initially. However, when the fetus is becoming compromised, Variable or late decelerations with or without fetal tachycardia and minimal or absent variability are frequently present. Acute near-term and term abruption, whether mild or severe, is typically managed by maternal stabilization followed by delivery. Delivery is recommended to minimize the risks of ongoing vaginal bleeding and the potential for maternal and fetal compromise an algorithm for the management of abruption at near-term and term gestations is presented here. At initial evaluation of new onset vaginal bleeding, abruption severity should be ascertained through thorough history, evaluating the inciting event and quantifying estimated blood loss. Clinical evaluation should incorporate assessment of vital signs, urine output, and mental status. The Advanced Trauma Life Support classification of stages of hemorrhagic shock incorporates these parameters to create a profile of clinical findings associated with various degrees of hemorrhage. Although the staging system has not been validated in pregnancy, it is presented as a theoretic framework to guide the clinical approach to resuscitation. The initial management should focus on maternal stabilization, including placement of large bore intravenous catheters and fluid resuscitation with crystalloids. STAT laboratory tests to evaluate hemoglobin and platelet count as well as coagulation parameters should be obtained. Blood products and coagulation factors may be needed with uncrossed type O negative blood immediately available and activation of massive transfusion protocols when clinically indicated. Fetal status should be assessed after initiating maternal stabilization efforts. A majority of abruption will have fetal heart rate changes though it is not clear if abruption and near-term and term gestations have different profiles of abnormal fetal heart rate patterns compared to abruption at preterm gestations. Intrauterine resuscitative measures such as maternal position changes and supplemental oxygen may be of limited benefit. Antenatal corticosteroids to promote fetal maturation may be considered prior to 36 weeks and six days 
when delivery is anticipated in seven days and prior to 37 weeks gestation. Tocolytics should not be utilized during this gestational age range. Magnesium sulfate is also not used during this range for neuroprotection, though it should be utilized for seizure prophylaxis in cases of preeclampsia with severe features. Abruption with heavy vaginal bleeding and near-term and term gestations requires prompt evaluation and management. Several principles guide this care, such as identifying the cause of bleeding, expediting delivery, providing supportive care, and early recognition of DIC. The administration of packed red blood cells and coagulation factors is an essential part of this supportive care. The main purpose of red blood cell transfusion is to improve oxygen carrying capacity. In stable pregnant patients with self-limited episodes of vaginal bleeding, restrictive approaches to blood transfusion may be considered. Clinical trials suggest that a hemoglobin of less than 6 to 7 grams per deciliter is appropriate for many patients. Transfusion in the context of active and heavy bleeding should not be based on specific hemoglobin thresholds and rather should be guided by vital signs, the amount of current and anticipated bleeding, and the projected length of time until delivery. Fresh frozen plasma contains all coagulation factors in fibrinogen. Its use is indicated when a pregnant patient with abruption is thought to have multiple acquired coagulation factor deficiencies, such as in cases of obstetrical hemorrhage treated with massive transfusion and in cases of DIC. Cryoprecipitate is a plasma-derived product that contains fibrinogen and other coagulation factors, including factor VIII, factor 13, and von Willebrand factor. Cryo remains a mainstay for treatment of acquired hypofibrinogenemia. Cryo should be administered to ensure the patient with abruption has fibrinogen levels that are greater than 50 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. In the context of active bleeding, platelets should be transfused to a goal of greater than 50,000 per cc. Often platelets are transfused in the setting of massive transfusion accompanying red blood cell and FFP transfusions. Coagulation studies have limitations to guide decision-making related to blood transfusion in the context of abruption with significant hemorrhage. These tests were developed to monitor the degree of coagulation conferred by exogenous anticoagulants, not to ascertain the bleeding risk of obstetrical patients. These limitations, as well as potential for delayed results, have driven interest in a point-of-care testing that characterize viscoelastic hemostatic properties, such as thromboelastography and rotational thromboelastometry. These tests evaluate the viscoelastic properties of clots, such as the time to initiate, the time to amplify, clot strength, and the degree of fibrinolysis, among other properties. The main advantages are in rapid results and goal-directed therapy. TEG and ROTEM results are typically available in 15 to 20 minutes, which is much faster than coagulation studies. Additionally, these point-of-care tests may direct resuscitative efforts to avoid overtreatment. Several simplified examples of TEG temograms are illustrated on this slide. In A, we see a normal temogram that shows the various properties of clot formation that are evaluated using TEG. In B, the normal temogram illustrates an adequate hemostatic profile. In cases of bleeding with this profile, uterotonic medications, intrauterine tamponade balloon, and other surgical approaches may be helpful to control bleeding. In C, there is prolonged R and K times, which suggests that acquired coagulation deficiencies are present and should be addressed with FFP. In D, there is a slightly prolonged R time, but the K time is prolonged, the alpha angle is decreased, and the maximum amplitude is decreased. The viscoelastic properties here suggest hypofibrinogenemia is responsible for bleeding and cryoprecipitate is indicated. Finally, in E, the K time is prolonged and the maximum amplitude is decreased, suggesting thrombocytopenia is the underlying etiology and platelet transfusion is indicated. In our review, we provide an example of an obstetrical hemorrhage protocol that employs TEG to guide blood component therapy we also provide more information about TEG and ROTEM and the viscoelastic properties that these point-of-care tests will evaluate. Abruption is the most common cause of DIC in pregnancy. 
Compared to other causes of obstetrical hemorrhage, pregnant people with significant abruption experience greater decreases in platelets, require more platelet transfusions, and have more acquired hypofibrinogenemia. DIC may be suspected based on clinical presentation and laboratory findings, but no single laboratory test is sufficient to make the diagnosis. The classic findings of DIC are low platelets, prolonged PT and PTT, and low fibrinogen levels. Scoring systems such as the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis DIC score was modified for pregnancy and is provided here on this slide. Although not widely used, a score of 26 or greater has a sensitivity of 88% and a specificity of 96% for the diagnosis of DIC. There are significant short-term and long-term maternal and perinatal risks associated with abruption. Short-term risks of abruption are often driven by hemorrhage. Pregnant people who experience abruption have increased risks of hemorrhagic shock, DIC, transfusion, and hysterectomy. Risks in the postpartum period also include intensive care unit admission and maternal death. Recent evidence suggests that pregnant people who experience clinical abruption are at increased risk of mortality from cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease, as well as non-fatal morbidity, pointing to long-term consequences of this condition. There is also evidence of increased risk of an array of neurological complications and neurodevelopmental deficits in the offspring of subjects who are exposed to abruption. Neonates exposed to abruption, particularly those complicated by pregnancies at preterm gestations, are at increased risk for a cystic periventricular leukomalacia and intraventricular hemorrhage. Abruption is also associated with a six to 10 fold increased risk of cerebral palsy and a two to four fold increased risk of developmental disorders in infants born of abruption pregnancies. In this review, we focus on abruption and near-term and term gestations when the impact of preterm birth is reduced and we can glean insights into the direct effects of abruption. We review the pathophysiology, epidemiology, diagnosis, and management of abruption at 34 weeks gestation and greater. In our review, we seek to provide comprehensive, clinically focused guidance during a gestational age range when neonatal outcomes can often be favorable if rapid and evidence-based care is optimized. Thank you for listening to this presentation and thank you to the editors of the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology for publishing um, this review article. We would encourage the interested reader to uh, review the manuscript uh, when it is published as there are much more details about the management and diagnosis of abruption in the manuscript. Thank you again.